Hi, Suze. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. How are you? I'm doing great. The sun is shining. We all survived the eclipse yesterday. Um, <laughs> so life is pretty good today. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, again, this is kind of a, a, a funny circumstance because I cold DM'd you, essentially. And I we love out. a cold reach out. <laughs> we, we do. We do frigid, frigid, ice cold. Um, and I, I was just so fascinated about what you guys were doing. And uh, we've spoken before about how this was kind of a bit of a personal interest to me as well and something that I had thought about in the past. So I really wanted to have you on the podcast because I know a lot of my audiences tend to be in the same boat as I am, whether they're young or um, whatnot. They might be on the pre-planning side of a family in a long-term relationship, trying to think about where that's going. Um, and I just feel like there's a lot of a lot of this conversation that is rarely had and a lot of uh, this topic that people don't talk about enough. So mm -hmm. without further ado, um, I guess we'll jump right into it. So start by, you know, telling the audience who you are, what you do, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me. I am uh, the co-founder and COO of a fertility and family building benefits platform called Sprout Family. So really we're on a mission to try and improve Canadians access to family building care. So like fertility, surrogacy, adoption, regardless of how you're building your family um, and regardless of your age, your gender, your sexual orientation, supporting all pathways to parenthood and helping that actually come through employer benefits rather than it always being a private pay structure for Canadians. So I think it's a, it's something that's definitely like a growing issue. Uh, Canada is actually pretty far behind. And when it comes to mm. covering support for family building, I think we have a bit of a misconception that, oh, it's Canada. So we have public health care. So therefore everything's covered. Um, and people don't realize that fertility has actually been pulled out of our public health care system. And so some of the provinces are managing actually providing improved access to things like IVF or in vitro fertility or um, other pathways to parenthood. But there isn't a like federally mandated structure that actually provides resources for people going through any sort of alternate journey to parenthood. Um, and my co-founder, Jackie, and I, so we both started this business, honestly, from our own challenges, running up against trying to get access to reproductive health care. Um, my co-founder, she has a funny family building story where her entire family is from assisted reproduction. So her and her twin sister were both IVF babies. Um, so their parents went through infertility and then um, had them choose successfully through IVF. And then the, her brother is adopted. So it was just like always a conversation in her, her home that the families don't always come in the way that people like learn from the stork. Uh, <laughs> and then for me personally, I have like coming from a different direction that's not typically talked about in the fertility space. And honestly, there might need to be a trigger warning on this, but I actually had an ab abortion two years ago. Um, and that really disrupted my mental health. I basically, it was like an unplanned pregnancy between me and my husband. But at that point we were 29, we bought our first home, we were married. Like it felt like we should probably just go forward with it. That's how I felt, but he didn't feel like emotionally and mentally ready for it. Uh, so it was really challenging, like for our relationship to then decide to terminate the pregnancy. And honestly, I totally spiraled at that point. I went through a pretty significant mental health crisis on my own because I recognized that I had given up something that I really did want. Maybe it wasn't the right time, but it's something I wanted in the long term. And I had a lot of fear that if I later had any challenges with my fertility, I would regret that decision for the rest of my life and always hate it. So being the kind of type A person that I am, I had to go ahead and figure out how to solve it. Um, and so did some research onto like, okay, how do you actually know? Are you fertile? Is this going to be an issue for you? And why don't we have access to that type of information? Um, I went out and I got my fertility tested. Overall, the results were positive. They're like, you're totally fine for your age. You shouldn't, this shouldn't be something that you should be worried about. Um, when you try to conceive naturally, it should be no problem. And I felt like this giant, weight come off my shoulder and I was like it's crazy that I've been so stressed for over a year about what I'd done to my long-term life when all I need to do was 
a $100 blood test to figure out that I'm actually probably okay. And I can park that for a little while and not be so stressed about my biological clock. I, first off, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, I mean, I, I know from close family that it is very, very rarely something that is easy to talk about. Um, but it's something that everybody goes through. And it's something that it happens to a lot more people than many care to admit um, mm -hmm. or recognize. So thank you very much for sharing that story. I, I think that, you know, it's, it, it really is something that should be looked at more is fertility. Uh, and people struggle with it constantly. There's so much of a societal stigma around, uh, particularly towards women, especially like actually uniquely towards women. I'll, I'll go ahead and say that. Um, that has that toll on your mental health. I mean, if you're somebody who does want kids, you want children, you want to be a parent, no matter how that happens. And you then are left with the wonder of, can I have kids naturally? And that just, notwithstanding the, the internal um, dialogue that is probably happening there, the amount of panic and anxiety that would be around, you know, okay, well, like, do I need to get on this right now? Like, that's something mm -hmm. that I've been thinking about a lot recently as well. You know, I, I came to terms with myself that I do want to have kids and I am a gay man. So with that comes a lot of layers. Um, and I'm like, where do I start? Like, where, where do I even start? I don't know. Like, and so it's for that reason that I thought that this conversation would be so, so necessary. And it's something that your that sprout family is pushing and it's something that i definitely believe in in being one of the key issues facing a lot of young people right now outside of um professional and uh, everything else but real interpersonal and personal issues so what what did that starting point look like for sprout family so you you're you and jackie are both coming into this with some pretty unique uh personal experiences what what made you guys pull the trigger? What was the motivation? What what did that uh, what did that you know first conversation look like? Yeah, so um, Jack and I had previously been working on another tech company together, um, and it was going through basically an acquisition strategy. So we knew that was ramping up, um, and so that gave us actually a lot of great space to think about like what we want to do next and. In my mind, I was like, oh, I'll just go get another job. But then having gone through these personal issues, we talked about it, honestly, a lot at the office. We had a pretty mm -hmm. open culture there, which was great. Um, and also spoke with so many coworkers that were going through their own family building journeys. Like there was maybe like about 10 people that went on parental leave during our last mm -hmm. couple of years at that company. And it was great. We're like, oh, all these people forming their families. It's so nice. But as we started to speak to them one on one, we learned that eight of them had actually gone through some sort of assisted reproduction, like they had all required support, whether that was because, you know, women pushing out when their timeline for when they had kids, or families forming with same sex couples or single intended parents, there's so many reasons why people actually need support today. And so despite the stats, they show that, you know, one in six people struggle with infertility is what the World Health Organization posts. But we actually believe it's a much higher number, especially when you're dealing with people that are in these knowledge worker careers, you're hustling, mm -hmm. you're trying to build up your career before yeah. you think about family planning. And then yes, in the back of your mind, you're, you do wonder, like, hey, like, what am I actually doing to my options long term? Um, and so that it, we basically recognize that there's a, there's a real issue here. It's showing up at work. Like as much as we want to put this in the basket of personal issues that people have to deal with, if you can't be your whole self at work because you're carrying this massive burden of dealing with something like surrogacy, for example, it's going to take multiple years, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like if you're dealing with that kind of burden in your own personal life, it's going to impact your ability to really be a productive and engaged employee. And so that helped us establish the business model of like there is actually a reason why employers would want to provide their employees access to the right resources to get through that parenthood journey as effectively as possible and not spend time spinning their wheels or going with providers that maybe aren't right for them. Like, for example, some fertility clinics don't serve uh, queer folk. And so you don't want to have your employees spending time going to these appointments and going to these clinics if they can't even meet their basic human needs. Um, so we felt there was a need for us to actually cr solve the problem in terms of the financial resources 
but then on top of that, actually improve access to the right types of care for your individual circumstance. Um, and so what Sprout evolved into is basically we offer two components to our product. The first is the financial benefits administration. So if you're an employer, you want to cover a lifetime maximum for family building care. Typically, it's like ten to $20,000 that can go towards egg freezing, surrogacy, adoption, any pathway to parenthood. Um, we will do the claims administration for you and make sure it's entirely confidential and tax efficient as much as possible. But then the second piece is the na navigation side through our virtual care platform. So that is, as I said, like helping people actually get to those objectives as efficiently as possible. If you have, you know, $20,000 of coverage from your employer, let's make sure that you're using that on a successful IVF cycle, rather than working with a provider that maybe isn't actually going to get you to those outcomes and spending more time and more emotional and like physical effort um, on something that won't actually work out. So that, uh, yeah, that led to the creation of what is now Sprout Family. So it is really meant to be like the end-to-end -end solution for employers to offer this to their employees. Um, and we've been really excited about the progress and the traction coming from HR teams. I just want to say how much I love the rationale behind your, and I like how you started it off as saying, you know, this is not a personal issue. Or it's not uniquely a personal issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that the, that's the kind of outside the box thinking that a lot of people fail to understand. Because a lot of people, you know, look at Sprout Family. And I've spoken to people since I discovered it. And I'm like, look at, look at this. Look at, look at what they're doing. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> we appreciate the support. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, I've gotten the, the typical like, oh, well, you know, it's, you know, yada, yada, yada. Oh, it's a personal issue. Why would people pay for that? And so I love that you just highlighted that just because something is a personal problem does not mean that it does not impact your professional life. Um, and that goes for many things. And fertility is definitely one that is often overlooked and not recognized as being something that employers should even engage in or, or, rec or talk about, really. And mm -hmm. I loved hearing that you're La that your last employer had such a good work culture that you guys could speak openly and honestly and, and confidently about what was happening and what was going on too. That's really nice to hear. And I, it, I feel like a lot of people will find that, uh, will, will be envious of that because it's, it's yeah. not something that we find very often. No, it's actually something that like, as we start to work with more HR teams and also doing research with companies that are currently offering like family mm -hmm. building care, um, one of the things that's actually come through in those conversations is that employers say, this is suddenly something that people are actually comfortable discussing a little bit at work. Like, obviously, it is your own personal life. You don't want to get into it necessarily. Or like, you should only share what you're comfortable with. But one mm -hmm. thing that's happened is like one employer, they started offering coverage. A woman was going through an IVF cycle. It's a three week process. You're on pretty intense hormones. It's a really intensive physical experience. Um, and so she told her team, I'm going through a cycle of IVF. I'm personally really stressed about this. This matters a lot to me. Like, hopefully my future child comes out of this. But also, I'm going to be on hormones. I'm going to have to go to appointments every single day. I'm not going to be my best self. I might be a little bit snappier. And it's kind of crazy to think that if you were going through any sort of other surgery, you would, that, that your workplace would just not know about it and you would just ignore it and pretend it wasn't happening. But and like you should be able to share when you're going through something that's as significant from a medical perspective, because it is going to impact your day to day. And so it's been really refreshing to hear that employers are coming back and saying that since we've now started to offer this, we have taken away the stigma of that this is a private matter that should never be shared. And we're just acknowledging that we know you're going through this. Here are the resources to help it be as effective as possible. And let's make sure that as you go through that journey, we support you and we're aware of the, what we can do on our side. That really is, I, and I mean, we are seeing a, a big shift in workplace, I guess, I don't want to say culture because it's not only culture, but like workplace dynamics, um, wh whether it's with remote work and all the different considerations for that. And then now with a lot of companies wanting to engage in more EDI and um, internal diversity and uh, impact uh, strategies, I, I really love hearing stories like that where companies are are not being restricted by their own desire to change. Um, and that that's really beautiful. It really is.
So tell us a little bit more then about what you guys have done so far, what you've seen as the major, and you've touched on it a bit, but I'm curious to know a bit more about what have been the major drawbacks or the major hurdles in this process and and developing this product? And, um, And or what do you anticipate being the next big hurdle that you guys will have to surmount? Um, and what did you do to overcome that? What are you planning to do to overcome those hurdles? Tell tell us a bit more about what that future looks like. Yeah. So, um, launching a startup is always full of challenges, of course. Um, we're about one year in, and so we've had like a good amount of time to build out our product and actually launch the market and get real experience working with customers and see how, uh, how it's impacting employees and their teams. Um, but I think the biggest challenge, honestly, is around the fact that I'm new to doing B2B or business to business sales. I am not a salesperson by trade. <laughs> I'm actually an accountant. I'm a CPA. So this is all very new to me. Um, and so I'm learning quickly, like this sales are so hard always, especially when you're doing with something, dealing with something that is pretty new and novel. And as I said, at the top of the conversation, like there is a bit of a misconception in Canada that oh, we're covered, like we're good, we have public health care, everyone's fine, and not realizing the fact that fertility is carved out of that. Um, so I think that we first have to help employers understand um, if they are offering coverage where those limitations are. So what's common in a lot of insurance packages today is that they will offer fertility drug reimbursements. So mm. that's if you're going through, for example, like going through an egg, egg freezing process, the medicine that you get put on, you could have that claimed. But it really is quite restrictive in terms of like, normally it's only helpful for like the heterosexual couple that gets diagnosed with infertility that's going through IVF, like they will get access to a few thousand dollars for coverage. But the person that's going through adoption or surrogacy or donor eggs, there's no coverage for any of those uh, support or procedures. So that was one thing where it's like, we feel like we need to help people understand this industry in a little bit more nuanced fashion. And if they feel like they've checked the box on fertility coverage because they have drugs, Actually, there's a lot, a lot further they could go, um, and it's also it's challenging when you're when you're selling something new and you don't have a track record of okay, if I run into points in friction in my sales process, mm. is it because I don't know what I'm doing as a salesperson because I've never done this before, or is it because like there's something wrong with our product that we actually need to go solve? Um, and when you have like a lack of data in that area and a lack of mm. history, it's really hard to make those evaluations. Um. And then one other thing that I think is unique to our experience so far is Jackie and I were female founders. Um, and there's so much conversation in the tech ecosystem about how women are underfunded. We only receive less than 2% of VC dollars. And I think when I was going into it, I was like, oh, well, you know, the companies must just be worse, worse mm-hmm. because like I couldn't objectively think of any reason why less money would go to no. one population. Um, but now that I've gone through the process and we did, uh, we did close around in December, learned that it actually is different conversations happening in the rooms, Mm -hmm. um, which is really, really frustrating when you're meeting with investors and you want to have a conversation about your business and then you're getting, you're dealing with things that are honestly discriminatory. It takes up space and it takes up time for someone to make a, like make a decision on whether or not you're an investable entity. Um, like some examples, uh, like I had one man tell me that in- infertility can't really be an issue because he just pulled the goalie and he got his wife pregnant. I was like, thanks, buddy. Um, I was chatting with one investor and I was like really excited about the conversation. And he seemed to be giving me like actual attention as I told my story about the business that we were building. Mm-hmm. And so I naturally just asked him like a pretty normal thing. of like, oh, like, tell me about yourself. And he's like, oh, I'm a father of two, but don't worry, I'm divorced. <laughs> Which you're just like, there was a wink if anyone's listening on audio, but <laughs> um, but you're like, oh my God, like I actually thought that you cared about my business, but great, like cheers, I'm on my way, thank you. <laughs> um, and then probably one of the worst comments was I had an investor um, who said that fertility is only an issue because women like you are choosing to build businesses instead of having babies when you should. And so at that, you're just like, oh my God, you know? So it's really hard when you're wasting valuable time having these conversations that you're like, I'm spending my time 
just navigating my feelings about this to be like, am I being too sensitive? Is this a me problem? Is this a them problem? Rather than using that brain to build my business and actually, you know, pitch the really investable company that we're that we're building today. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely frustrating. And I think that it's it's been helpful actually getting some real examples. And I think that's what's kind of missing in the conversation about how women receive less funding is that there's all the stats, but without the stories, it's really hard to know what's driving that limitation. And I can, I know from my experience can actually pinpoint to the fact that we need to be having different conversations and not have bias show up in Mm -hmm. discussions around investment. First off, that's disgusting. (laughs) Like that's awful that you ever had to be subjected to that <laughs> in I'm going to go have babies now because that's what that investor told me to do. Clearly, clearly you're doing the, you're not doing the right thing here, Suze. Um, but I, I, I watched this, um, docu, this like kind of docu series that came out on the Theranos mishap. Um, mm. and it was the, the dropout, um, on Disney plus and great series, by the way. Like if you're into like the dramatic startup scene, I read like, the book. That's, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Um, and one thing that they really pressed in that movie is, uh, because it's, it's about a female founder who, um, is now currently serving a a lengthy sentence in, in jail, um, and for fraud and amongst other, uh, mishaps. And they talk often about how the mistakes and the, the, the fraud that she was doing was going to impact women entrepreneurs for generations to come. And I think that we've seen that in a lot of different sectors, um, how people are often, and I I say people as in like male counterparts, are often quick to villainize women just because some woman, uh, you know, 20 years ago did something that she wasn't supposed to. And so now we need to be skeptical of all women when they start companies. Um, when that is just absolutely illogical and stupid. Um, and, but it, it really does shed light on the additional, additional, plur- like additional hurdles, plural, that are placed on women founders. And I, I've spoken, I spoke with a friend of mine who is, uh, in the process of starting, uh, her first round. And she told me about how, a lot of the time she would receive one phrase answers uh, from VCs and it would say, you know, come back to me when you have a bit more experience verbatim. That's one that she got. Um, Whereas, and I always think about that and her and I had a pretty long conversation after she received that email. And I said, you know, if I had sent that email, that pitch email, I wouldn't have gotten that answer back. And it's not because her and I have any kind of different experience. We actually have very similar professional experience. But we just know that if I, with a male name, had put had sent that email, um, and maybe, you know, in a different tone or, or whatnot, and I, I was a bit more, you know, men tend to be a bit more uh, of a... <laughs> in their emails. Um, and so if I, if I was able to do that, then maybe the answer would have been different. And it's just that terrible, 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 terrible culture amongst VCs that makes people not even want to start because why, why would you to be subjected to conversations and remarks like you were in those meetings? Like that's a waste of your time and it's demoralizing, I think is a good way to put it. No, that's like, that's exactly the right word because it's it just leads to always second guessing yourself Mm -hmm. of being like is it my product is it the business that we're building is it me being an incompetent founder or is it my gender and how will i ever know when these hurdles come up which one it's pointing to if it's my gender then i don't care shut the door on that investor they're not worth my time goodbye if it's because of like my competence or founder fit, I absolutely want to address that. And if it's mm-hmm. something about our business, absolutely, we need to be working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard when you're getting sort of ambiguous feedback and not not knowing what the source is. And I think the other challenge is that I don't want to come across as someone that's like, VCs are bad, they're not supportive. I've spoken with so many amazing investors that have been so supportive. Some of our biggest advocates mm-hmm. have been like so many men that also one of the one of the really refreshing things we're actually seeing is men are really starting to take a 
active role in fertility, whether it's a heterosexual relationship or not. And in our member base, we're actually seeing that users are like 45, 55 split between male and female. So 45% male, which is it's not 50, 50, but considering the fact that women have to carry the, the physical Mm -hmm. uh, weight of going through fertility treatments, we've had really, really nice conversations with men that are like, well, my wife has to go to all the appointments. So, you know, I'm going to at least go and figure out the finances for her and make sure we (laughs) get all of our claims back. And I'm like, amazing. Thank you. You know, so it's actually been really exciting to see, um, men take an active role in, in this from both like a customer standpoint, um, and an investor standpoint. But that doesn't change the fact that sometimes there are a couple of people that will make those comments that really cast a lot of self-doubt on your on your journey. And my co-founder and I, we really had to get good at calling it out when it was happening. We'd go through a meeting. We'd both feel a bit icky about it. And then afterwards, it would always be like, okay, that one thing he said, he or she, but only he, because there's a lot, of, a lot more male investors, unfortunately. Um, did that make you feel some sort of way? And mm. typically we'd be like, oh, okay, yes. We both felt a little bit or by whatever comment it was. And so we one had to call it out. And then the other thing that we had to do is we had to realize when we were discounting ourselves because of a lack of confidence, because we were receiving those types of remarks. Mm. Um, so basic things like when we're going and we're sharing what we want our business valuation to be, like mm. we need to have confidence in that. When we're pricing, when we're quoting prices to customers, We got in a really unhealthy habit between the two of us where, you know, someone would ask ask us for pricing. It would be like, okay, so we want to charge X, but okay, let's just give them something lower and hopefully they'll sign. Mm. Um, And we started calling it girl math, actually. (laughs) Like I know girl math has a different meaning, but in our mind, we're like, no, no, no. Girl math is when you're worth a hundred dollars, but then you tell them that you're worth 50, you know, and that's, that's what we need to catch ourselves doing. And I'm actually, I feel quite fortunate that, I'm married to a guy in BC and he eavesdropped on a couple of conversations where we were girl mathing down our valuation. And he came in and was like, what the heck are you guys doing? You had one investor push back on your valuation. Everyone else knows your worth. You can go ask for what you want. That's okay. And it actually makes a huge difference. Just having someone be able to tell you like, stop, stop discounting yourself, whether Mm -hmm. that's coming from your own gender bias internally or wherever it's coming from, you don't know, but it's good to be able to like call it out and have a co-founder that really keeps you accountable. I I think you now also touched on another big hurdle that a lot of startup founders need to go need to cross is self doubt. I mean, it's gender based is is an entirely different subject in and of itself, but um, self doubt as a founder can be lethal. It really can. And I've been involved in founder teams previously, and um, I'm presently involved in founder teams. And it's, uh, it really does take a bit of delusion, a bit of delusion, (laughs) just a little bit, just a sprinkle, a dash, if you wish, um, to convince yourself that hell yeah, hell yeah, I'm able to do what I what I know I can do. And I'm hell yeah, I'm able to be the co founder of this company. And it, it it's it's a difficult process, and there are, there are days where it's easier than others, but it's good to have great people around you, and great people there supporting you. People like your your, your husband who are there, you know, saying like, "What are you doing? Like, yeah. no, you are worth that amount. Tell them that valuation, and and things like that." And also having great co founders, it just makes it all so much easier because you do really need to I don't want to say fake it till you make it because that implies that you know there's a bit of uh, whatever but essentially fake it until you make it and and proving telling people you know give me a chance and let me prove to you what I know I can already do and again that's the kind of relationship we have with early investors is okay here's the idea here's our product we maybe we don't have an MVP yet. Maybe we, you know, we're we're still working on our, you know, uh, our customer segments or whatnot. But here's the idea. Here's where we want to go with it, and here's why we think we're the best people to do it. And that conversation is one that takes a lot of confidence and it takes a lot of self self assurance. But it, it's something that founders have to go through every day, and it's something that 
every founder before you had to go through and every founder after you will have to go through until the end of time. So I, I really like that you shared that, that story on, you know, what that has been like as a female founder in, you know, in a, not only a, in a new area and in a new segment of business, but also, or new segment of like the insurance coverage sector, which is a, a very old sector and one that is not very used to disruption. Um, mm -hmm. But then also connecting with companies that are both male and female led and seeing that there is this, this shift in support for these services and that they are realizing the value that Sprout Family and uh, alternative fertility services and coverage provide both to their employees and I imagine also to their financial pocketbooks. Um, so th this is really, really special. So you said that you closed around in December. Um, what do you see being the future of Sprout Family? You know, going into one, three or five years from now, wh what do you see being uh, Sprout Futures, I guess, when it fully sprouts? Um, what does that tree look like? Yeah. I also hate um, that I just made that joke. I'm just going to throw that in there quickly. It's so hard to avoid <laughs> using sprout as a verb. <laughs> um, and also we're in this funny industry where there were a couple of fertility clinics that launched around the same time that we launched our business, which mm. is in the insurance space, a couple of fertility clinics launched. One is called Twig Fertility. Another is called <laughs> Pollen Fertility. So we're like Pollen, Twig, and Sprout, just a really strong cohort. <laughs> yeah. yeah, siblings. Yeah. Um, or because we're all on brand. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so one thing that's been like a quick evolution in our service is we've realized that we've actually established a marketplace for the demand and the supply side. So the suppliers that are like fertility clinics, surrogacy agencies, family lawyers, um, they're always looking for new opportunities and referrals. And so if we're able to provide them people that have the education and the financial resources to actually get started on a process, that is very valuable, right? So if they're having someone show up at their fertility clinic and that person has access to employer paid funds, and they actually understand what the journey is going to look like for them. That means that that person is less likely to show up at the clinic, get a consultation, get scared by the numbers and walk away. Um, and so they're using less doc doctor time to prepare for mm. those consultations and deal with churn. Um, so it's actually been really exciting to see how quickly we've been able to uh, establish relationships with these providers across those different groups, like all pathways to parenthood, um, where they're offering like Sprout member discounts, um, and easier ways for our members to actually get access to the care that they need at preferred prices. So that's really motivating that we feel like we can actually build a much more efficient market that is benefiting all, all groups, right? Like the employee is getting access to the care they need from providers that are reputable. The employer knows that if they're spending money, that it's actually going to go towards like an effective outcome. And the providers are getting vetted uh, customers that actually have the resources to get started on a journey without spending additional time. So that's been one exciting evolution. And the other more recent one is expanding into telehealth services more directly. Uh, so we originally built our product to be mostly a referral service of helping people understand like which clinic they should then go to. Mm. Um, but we learned that Canada is facing an issue where there's actually a lot of what we're calling fertility deserts, like mm. significant areas across Canada that just don't have any fertility clinics because mm -hmm. it is a private system they like they're going to set up shop where they know that they can actually have a market of people mm. that can afford care and unfortunately there's areas of like northern ontario where there's no clinics many cities across the prairies don't have access to anything um there's a couple a uh, couple of provinces out east that don't have a single clinic so every single individual is going to have to travel to receive care and so one of the things we wanted to do is actually provide a telehealth platform that will enable people to get access to the support they need without always having to travel for care. Like there's initial work you can do of like, you have a consultation on our telehealth platform, go get a blood test done at whatever your local provider is, whether it's a life labs or something, and then carry on the conversation. But there's a lot you can do without actually spending multiple days potentially traveling to a fertility clinic and the additional costs. Um, so those have been two like exciting evolutions of like how we can establish these partnerships and then layer on telehealth services to make it as efficient a process as possible. Um, but long term, really, what we want to do is we don't just want to focus on family building, like family building is chapter one for us. 
we want to be the go-to solution for like family wellness across someone's mm -hmm. life. So that's starting with fertility, surrogacy, and adoption. The next chapter, we do want to um, look to pre and postnatal care. How can we support the journey around pregnancy? We're actually, we have our first couple of sprout babies, um, or at least sprout pregnancies. Um, and so naturally our members are like, okay, so what now? And we actually want to be able to answer that with, with some useful resources. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there we're we also want to address some other issues just in uh, like underserved areas of women's health. Menopause is a massive one, um, just been like completely ignored and has a significant impact in the workplace, especially as people are continuing to work longer as, as women mm -hmm. in leadership position. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity that we see to take the platform and the tooling that we built and then launch it into ad additional care, care services to really just improve the amount of utilization and the value proposition for employers, uh, which will hopefully then fuel our further customer acquisition. That's amazing. That is amazing. What a bright, bright future for, for Sprout Family. That is well, awesome. Well, we just have to go do it, which is the minor yeah. minor nuance. Have to Meh. go build it all, but <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> we can what figure is that, that part out. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the girl math comes into play. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, you know, it just it just discounting happens. is actually helpful in that case. I'll be like, oh, it only <laughs> take a couple of years, and five years later, we're only halfway. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know the the huge. Um, all right. Well, I have one last question to ask you, um, which is one that I've asked all of my guests so far. Um, what is one teaching or lesson or um it could be a quote it could be a quote it could be whatever that you've kept with you throughout your entrepreneurial journey so far or professional career as well yeah one thing i think one thing that i've learned stepping into the role of founder out of my regular role as employee um <laughs> is that you are your brand and so you're putting yourself in the most vulnerable position because when someone rejects your offer for investment, when a customer says no, it's going to feel so, so personal because the business is you as an individual really in the early days, but that also can be your superpower. Um, so I think in today's environment, none of us trust advertising, right? Like no one's going to buy something because they see a paid ad. You're going to buy things that the, you, the influencers and the thought leaders in your network really believe in and are able to make a strong case for. And so it's while it's an uncomfortable place to be, it's also really powerful to know that I can be the thought leader in this space. I can establish this brand today of what Sprout is and who we are. Um, and hopefully that'll actually translate into long-term success. And while it's really, really uncomfortable every single day, whether it's posting on LinkedIn, joining a podcast, whatever it is that's <laughs> stressful today, um, it will be worth it as we build something that actually is meaningful and sustains because it relies on thought leadership in a new space rather than just trying to push people to buy or invest in something that they don't understand. That's an excellent, excellent add to that conversation. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, Suze, this has been a lovely, lovely, lovely time. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think that this conversation has been so enlightening, both for myself and also for, I'm sure, all that will watch this episode. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for um, sharing what Sprout Family is doing now and what you hope it will do in the future to help young people and families and people struggling uh, with fertility. And I think that that's really special. So thank you so much. Amazing. Thanks so much for the time. Hope you have a great rest of your day.